Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We are so excited about this event. Obviously, we're all reading what's going on in Wisconsin and the other states about the very basic right of public employees to organize. So when we first started thinking about this, we had no idea how topical it would be. I am Rita Henley Jensen. I am founder and editor-in-chief of Women's E-News. Yay! I have the pleasure, the enormous pleasure, of introducing to you Kate Kelly, our fabulous board member, who did all the work organizing this event for you. Uh, she's a blogger. She blogged on Huffington Post about this event and the history of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Please find it. Uh, and she has, she's an historian, she loves history, and she has her own website, and it is America Comes Alive, and boy, is she lively. So this is all of her grand idea. Please welcome Kate Kelly. Yeah, yeah. My goal right now is to explain to you how this evening came about, and I am just one small part of the piece. I am serving as Women's History Chair for Women's E! News, and in that capacity, I was invited to come to the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition event because we knew that for Women's History Month in 2011, we wanted to in some way acknowledge what happened to, to mainly immigrant women. 146 <coughs> young immigrants died in that fire, and we wanted to be certain to be part of the centennial commemoration of that because it seems a very important part of the women's story. Uh, so the idea for this evening came because of this, this coalition. At that event, I met up with Carmelina Carte, who is a, in charge of the immigrant rights part of the Triangle Coalition, but she also teaches here at Hunter with the Gender Studies Program. And in that process, she and I became friendly with Tony Coffey and Ashton Stewart of the League of Women Voters of New York City. And we all grouped together to create this program. Uh, we have remarks from several invited guests, and the format of this evening is first I would like to have RuPaul Oza welcome us to this space, and we thank her in advance for letting us come here, and then we'll have a couple of guests speak, and then we'll proceed with our panel. And I'm, I'm hoping you're hearing by this time. Are, are things working better? All right, thank you. RuPaul. Thank you all, and welcome to Hunter College. It's such a delight to see so many people here. It's such a huge occasion. It's not only the centennial where we are sort of remembering the Triangle Shortwaist Factory Fire, but it is also 100 years of celebrating International Women's Day. So if you will join me in, in sort of marking that occasion. Unlike here, most countries around the planet make a big deal and fanfare about it. And by golly, we should. Let me just begin by saying a couple of different things. Um, and in particular, acknowledging Carmelina Carte, who is one of our faculty members here, who's done tremendous work. I mean, she's just been heroic, as well as so many of our students who are here, and those students who are part of Women and Gender Studies, if you would just stand up. Come on, don't be shy. I know you're busy. All right. Excellent. Um, I just want to begin with a few things that I want to say. You know, the consequences of the tragedy led itself certainly to the establishment of labor movements and labor laws led to the establishment of the International Garment, um, Ladies' Government Workers Union, et cetera. But 100 years later, we still face challenges, right? 67% uh, of garment workers in LA still have wage violations. 63% in New York City. 98% of those garment workers in LA work in unsafe safety conditions of working today. This 100 years later, we still sort of do that, right? What this means for all of us, to just really briefly and very quickly quote uh, Dorothy Thomas, who's the founding editor of the Women's Rights Division of um, Human Rights Watch, and she, this is what she says. There is a sense that women's rights are somehow lesser than human rights. People would tell me that these issues don't, don't give rise to genocide, disappearances, that they're not serious violations. They are personal, they're marginal, they're family, right? This enforces the fact that we need to have, as a group of people, to organize, to strategize for fundamental change, so that women's labor is never erased, diminished, undervalued, or exploited, right? In the beginnings of the second decade of the new millennium, 
we are faced by a situation in which women disproportionately face the brunt of war from Iraq and Afghanistan to uh, disasters from Katrina, Haiti, Chile, and most recently in Australia. But this is not just the fact that women face the brunt of exploitation, oppression, um, in terms of war and disaster, but even in peacetime. The most recent statistics we have is that violent crime in New York City, we should be happy to know, has fallen. And by that I mean murder and robberies. But what has risen dramatically is 34% rise in rape, right? And that should give us pause and should give us uh, thought for concern. We need to generate ways in which thinking like this becomes archaic. Right? We need to be part of movements and possibilities that fundamentally challenge the way we think and live our lives. One of the small ways in which we are doing it, and one of the ways in which our, our students and our faculty at Hunter College are especially spearheading in this, is to make women and gender studies at Hunter a department. Programs and departments are very different. Programs are not funded, do not have autonomy, do have very less commitment from institutions. Uh, departments get those. They have more faculty lines, there's more support, there is, there is much more serious uh, efforts to sort of deal with our students and our curriculum. Women and Gender Studies is proud to be one of the largest uh, majors in the country. We have over 85 majors, and right? they are amazing. They are breathtakingly brilliant and fabulous. We need to be part in our small corner of the world to support the possibility for a Women and Gender Studies department at Hunter College. This is what we are campaigning for. And if you can spread the word, help join support, we will be deeply grateful. I do want to end, though, on a more positive note, right? Um, because I think that that, I mean, in some ways that I'm optimistic, but also in some ways, this is what I generally do believe. We live in a world not filled with oppression and exploitation alone. There's lots of that. God knows. It's breathtaking how much of it is. But we also live in a world in which that exploitation and oppression is fought for by thousands and thousands and thousands of people that have very little, right? And that is incredibly humbling. We have people from Egypt to Tunisia to Wisconsin who stand up for the rights of people and look for justice. And the fact that that changes and that, and that possibility exists is remarkable. And what I ask for you today, as you are part of this remarkable day and on 100 years of International Women's Day, to join hands, to let's stand in solidarity with workers all over the world, men and women, so that this will never happen again. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. And I think what I'd like to do at this point is give you some idea of the panel that awaits you. And then I, we've got two additional speakers to welcome you this morning or this evening, but I, I would like to give you an idea of what's to come. Um, the program tonight was titled The Fire That Ignited a Movement of Women Workers, and it's going to be addressed by four speakers. On my far right, we're going to start with Hasia Diner, who is a historian with an expertise in the immigrant experience. She is the Paul S. and Sylvia Steinberg Professor of American Jewish History at New York University and director of the Goldstein Gorin Center for American Jewish History. She will talk about the immigrant experience and what happened to the workers on that fateful day. And then we're going to jump to the second person who, on my right, Mei Wai Chen, is a consultant and adjunct professor with the Joseph S. Murphy Institute at City University of New York, and an active volunteer with the United Service Employees International Union. She retired from the union after more than 25 years of representing garment workers in New York City, and she will address the relatively recent fight for improved conditions for women who are employed in factories in Chinatown. We have Priscilla Gonzalez, Director of Domestic Workers United, which was founded in 2000 to end exploitation of domestic workers and organize for respect and fair labor standards. She will talk about the recent gains they have made in New York State and explain how this might expand throughout the country. And then we will come back to the person next to Hasia Diner, to Allison Weingarten, and she is Legislative Director of the New York State Assembly Subcommittee on Workplace Safety. The subcommittee was formed 18 months ago, and they have already introduced legislation regarding various forms of worker safety. They have also hosted the first annual Occupational Health Awareness Week and passed legislation in the Assembly and Senate, such as the State Workforce Injury uh, Reduction Act. Thank you.
there's a couple of other important people whom we've invited to be here tonight. One of them is Miriam Edelman, who is the president of the League of Women Voters. And the League has been a, an important partner in organizing this evening, but I think it's particularly important to have Miriam speak for a few moments because, as, as many of you are aware, that women got the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment, and one of the first issues that the League decided to wrestle with was that of worker safety. So they're very important to us tonight, and I would like to call Miriam to come and, and say a few words. I'm president of uh, the New York City League of Women Voters. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this evening's program, Remembering the Triangle Fire. As we all know, March is Women's History Month, and tonight we celebrate International Women's Day, a global celebration of the economic, political, and social achievements of women. But we are also here to remember the Triangle Fire, an event that occurred nearly 100 years ago on March 25, 1911. This fire that claimed the lives of 146 women and men, many of them only teenage girls, led to numerous changes in occupational safety standards that uh, pretend sometimes to uh, ensure worker safety today. The fire, its devastating aftermath, and the enactment of these worker protection laws will be the focus of this evening's program. The League of Women Voters was founded in 1919. From its inception, the League has worked for equal rights and social reforms. In the early years, the League was one of the first organizations to address such issues as child welfare, maternal and child health programs, child protection laws, and laws that discriminated against women. The League is proud to co-sponsor this evening's program. Thank you. And now we have one more speaker before uh, we actually turn to our panel, and this is actually quite a treat. We have Barbara J. Ingrams Edmonds, who is here representing Lillian Roberts. Uh, Lillian Roberts was an early labor leader who was executive director of District Council 37, which is New York City's largest public employee union. And particularly in light of all the things that are happening in Wisconsin, it is a particular pleasure to ha have Ed Ingram Edmonds here to speak to us. She's currently director of field services for District Council 37, and she oversees among many other divisions, but with the one of worker safety. So I'd like to call her up for a few remarks. Thank you so much. Lillian regrets that she wasn't uh, able to be here, but she does want to let me know that I have to make sure that we thank uh, especially uh, Woman E! News, the League of Women Voters, I, the wonderful partners here with the Women and Gender Program at Hunter College, and our wonderful distinguished panel. This is a great opportunity. I see folks from Cornell, Lois Gray, and many other uh, advocates that have really led the battle for women's rights particularly in the labor movement. So uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. One, this is a critical time for us uh, as we celebrate the 100 years, uh, both of the celebration uh, and the commemoration of women's rights, as well as the commemoration of the terrible tragedy uh, that affected uh, the shirtwaist factory. At District Council 37, we represent over 125,000 workers and 50,000 retirees. Probably over 70% of that workforce are women that look like many of you in this audience, particularly women of color who are faced with many of the challenges as well as many of the opportunities uh, in the labor movement that we're dealing with today. So as we deal with the struggles in Wisconsin where we represent many of the public sector workers uh, across that country and across the world, as we face some of the challenges politically and the battles that we have here around workers' rights, we are very happy to also look at women as the ones that have generally been getting us out of this mess, and I think you'll all agree to that. Uh, so again, I want to bring greetings on behalf of Lillian Roberts, and I want to thank you all for inviting us here tonight. I don't want to take up too much time because we have a wonderful panel here tonight that's going to really illuminate on the issues we're facing. So thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to hearing the wonderful remarks from our panel.